maybe after your presentation, and then you have the floor for 45 minutes of presentation. Please. Thank you, President of the jury. Thank you, all the jury and the audience for being here. I will read the title again. And then double scale approach the second gradient regularization applied to Granon material model. And then stands for finite element model, discrete element model. This is the outline of my presentation. I will start uh, introducing the philosophy of the model. Then I will introduce the method in which I will present all the developments and will implement it into the model. Then I will present some results and I will end up with conclusions. So in this image, I want to illustrate uh, what motivates this study. I show uh, a valid observation from Anja. It's a typical engineering problem. And when we want to model this with numerical approaches, we have the dilemma of, of using a continuum approach or a discrete approach. In the figure, I want to illustrate the differential volume, which is illustrative of the continuum approaches, and then a microscope image of the microscale of all material that shows that at the microscale we have a discrete uh, kind of configuration with grain, cement, different minerals, etc. So, we have to make a choice. If one of the approaches has its own advantages and disadvantages, we have the continuum approaches are numerically efficient and can model problems with any size without uh, scale problems. While discrete approaches are good because they use a more physical and meaningful description of the positive flows, they don't need the use of the so-called phenomenological laws that continuum approaches use. And they can describe more realistically the microscale. So what we want to do is to avoid having this dilemma and uh, build a model that will have the advantages of both continuum and discrete approaches. What we propose to do this is to build a macroscale boundary value problem, which is modeled using a continuum model. But instead of providing a positive law, uh, which is built by phenomenological means, we will build the, the, the constitutive law from a microscale numerical model. And in this case, we propose to use a discrete model at the microscale to capture all these advantages of the discrete approaches that I described. What we propose at the macroscale is to use a finite element model, Lagamin, developed in Liège University in Belgium. And in the micro scale, we'll use a discrete element model with periodic boundary conditions developed in GSR, mainly by like the from and the workers. Here I will describe uh, in what consists of our discrete element model. It's a two dimensional discrete element model which uses frictional cohesive contact laws. And uh, it, we consider damage and the uh, in the cohesive bond. So depending on our strain stress path, we can break these uh, bonds and have the, the, some deterioration of the mechanical properties. In addition, we consider periodic boundary conditions. The choice of these kind of boundary conditions is because it's something in between displacement boundary conditions and force boundary conditions. It's not as rigid as displacement, not as, uh, it doesn't allow as many degrees of freedom as force boundary conditions. And in the figure, I illustrate one of our RVs after the preparation. So we see the, uh, this is a 400 grains uh, RV. And we see the force network in red lines, in which the width of the line represents the force material. So once we build this micro scale, sorry, once we build this uh, discrete model, we're able to run discrete element simulations. So what I show in this figure, is a typical response of a discrete element model. <coughs> this is a qualitative uh, figure. I don't want to show uh, numerical values. But this is the response of a compression by Excel test in which in the abscissa we have the displacement and the force in the other coordinate. And we see that we, it presents a elastoplastic branch at the beginning. And once it reaches the peak and the softening branch, it has kind of noisy behavior that is very characteristic of this kind of uh, numerical approach. So what we want to do with this is to numerical homogenize to get the constitutive law that we will inject into the Gauss points in our macro, macro scale. I present the, the equation that we use to homogenize our RGB. So what we are homogenizing here are the stresses 
I will be using our procedure in the This is the idea of the model, and here I present what have, what have been done before. The first work with family literature are, are like an echo and terada in Japan, 2003. They are ready with a boundary value problem with uh, this finite element, discrete element, multi scale approach. And after that, there was a gap of several years in which uh, it seems no one was working in this model. So, some years here after, we have Mia here, 2010, and Nitka in this lab, 2011. Nitka was the pioneer in this lab with this method. And at that time, Nitka only developed a few elements. So, it was a multi scale problem, but he was not modeling uh, big uh, boundary value problems with the typical finite element meshes. Later, we have Guan Chao, 2013, from Hong Kong University. They get into this, um, in this approach. And Guyen, 2013, was the second PhD in this lab uh, working with Hemdem. And we see that 2013 was the time when I started my PhD. So after that, there was a lot of activity in, in this field. We see that uh, there was the introduction of DM cohesion, non-local regularization by the group, DD microscale, DM material heterogeneity. This material heterogeneity, this was the subject of a master project that I supervised back in 2015, 16, sorry. And I will present the results in this presentation. Then macroscale hydromechanical coupling and full micro macro 3D. After presenting the history of this method, I will summarize what are the performances of the model. We see that we still observe very bad conversions, and if it happens to converge, the model has it's very time consuming from the computational point of view. <coughs> These are problems that later I will explain come from the model itself, from the FEMDEM approach. And then we have a generic issue, which is the maze dependency. This is something typical from any continuum approach that has a softening constitutive law. So we'll also try to solve this problem. What we propose to mitigate or solve this problem is to provide the model with an alternative Newton operator, parallelize it to speed up the computational time, and regularize the solution using a second gravity approach. So I will start explaining the method. I will begin with the Newton operator. I have to start mm, defining what the constitutive law we are using. We have the quasi-static evolution of a continuous medium, and this is the kind of constitutive law that we're using is very similar to hypoplasticity or elastoplasticity constitutive laws. So we have uh, in the expression number one that we get the stresses in function of the deformation tensor. And the superindex f means that this is obtained at the end of a step. What is this step? The step is mm, because we, the problem is time dependent. At the macro scale, we are loading step by step. So this equation is solved at each one of the macroscopic steps. But the problem is still not linear. So to find the solution at each one of the steps, we need to use some iterative method. And in this case, we'll use a Newton approach. Newton approach needs a linearized expression of the constitutive equation, that's what we see in equation number two. And this needs the differentiation of the constitutive equation. It's the, it's the term C, which is a tangent operator. Usually, tangent operator, it's, it's obtained differentiating the, the constitutive equation. But if a Class form of our analytical expression it cannot be obtained if we will use numerical means in order to obtain the expression of the tangent operator. Here I define how we use a perturbation method to obtain all the coefficients of the, all the coefficients of the tangent operator. So in the equation four, we see the process the procedure in which we, the lambda parameter is defined in the equation three. So this is an orthonormal basis of the same dimension of the, of the deformation tensor. And we are, what we are doing here is 
system plus the force and displacement vectors. And by doing this, you will obtain all the coefficients of our, of our operator. In addition, this uh, method takes into account the, the free stresses of the, of the RV. These two operators mm, theoretically give the same results apart from numerical errors. So using one of the other will depend on what's the size of our microscale. Because a priori, the DEM quasi-static operator is a bit more time consuming because of the numerical approach. But actually, even if the analytical approach can be solved in only one iteration by solving a linear system of equations, because we know that the resolution of a linear system of equations by using the typical methods, LU decomposition, Cholesky, etc., is proportional to the cube of the degrees of freedom of this, of this linear system of equations. It happens that when we surpass some size of the RV, the solution, the resolution of this linear system of equations will be more time consuming than the numerical perturbations using the numerical approach. So we will have a threshold in which uh, we'll use one or the other depending on the, on the size of our RV. And finally, I present the Kreit operators that use a simplistic approach was developed by Kreit he, in his work, he was trying to define the elastic properties of a granular assembly using statistical and thermodynamic uh, approaches. So in the first equation, we see the upper bound Kreit operator. This was the operator proposed by Kreit. And uh, it provides an upper bound of the elastic model. This means that uh, we had the idea to improve it because we know it's an upper bound of the elastic model. Properties of our, of our RGB. What we did in the second operator is to correct it by using the actual values of a consistent tangent operator. And this gave a better approximation of the actual elastic properties. And we did this uh, using a different uh, degrees of correction, uh, using one single coefficient or several degrees of freedom, which gives a more and more corrected. Uh, Finally, inside this uh, Kreit uh, operator family, we have the, what we call the Kreit augmented operator. This is something that we developed. Mm, the idea was to, to give a better representation of the physics of the model, because the Kreit, if we look at the first equation, we only see a homogenization of the contact directions and the uh, stiffnesses of the contacts. But it doesn't take into account the rotation of the grains. So the Kreit moment it takes into account the rotation of the grains. In addition, it also takes into account the free stresses of the of our microscale. <coughs> so now that I define all the operators, I will compare its per their performances. These two plots are the convergence plots uh, in a finite element approach, in which in the left we see the initial part of a compression by XL test, so it's almost elastic, it's in the very initial uh, stage. In the second part, we in the softening branch after the localization of cool. So what we can comment is that looking at the first plot, we see that uh, some operators have uh, convergence rate which seem to be quadratic because we see a parabola in the semi-logarithmic plot. These operators are the ones that define the best elastic properties of our model for this stage of the test. We see that the consistent tangent operator, the the Right operator correct with two degrees of freedom, and the, the right operator with the augmented, uh, the right augmented operator with taking into account the rotational degrees of freedom have kind of quadratic movements. Why the simplistic right operators? We see that uh, have much less uh, quadratic uh, uh, convergence velocity because they don't give a good approximation of our of our microscale. Then if we look at the second plot, we see a quite different image. We see that most of operators have a kind of linear convergence. We, this is not due to the finite element discrete element approach, but uh, most of the uh, finite element approaches, even with, with analytical laws, they will not show quality convergence after the softening branch. And a second thing that we can observe is that the the maximum precision that we can get after the softening is not very is not 
that high. It's not as high as mm -hmm. the first floor. This is because the disk nature of a microscale, when grain sliding starts to occur, the numerical precision that our microscope can provide is much lower. So we see that we are in a, in a level of around 10 exponent minus 2 in the precision that we can get. So this gives us an, a, a qualitative idea of what the convergence uh, performance of each operator. And now what I do is I choose a convergence criteria for the residual of the forces. And I compare the number of iterations of each, of each oper operator to compare them uh, in a more regular basis. So when we can conclude from this plot, where I summarize the number of iterations that the different operators need, both for the initial <coughs> part of our conversion by XL test, we are, which are the blue lines, and for the softening branch, which are the red lines, is that the perturbation-based operators have a good performance in initial stages because uh, since they provide a good description of the elastic properties, they can convert uh, the fastest plus to quality conversions. But when we approach the softening, because the characteristics of our positive growth, uh, they lose the, the stability and they don't provide uh, they don't provide the result anymore. So we don't have convergence. In the cried operators uh, solve this problem, the non-stability during the softening branch, mm, but they give much worse res results during the elastic branch. So we see that the blue lines are much higher, especially for the upper bound cried operator. And as uh, as we correct them with more and more degrees of freedom, we see that the blue lines get lower because we get better convergence in the elastic part. And finally, the elastic operators, the DM, well like operator and fish test just like operator, give the the best uh, give the best performance both in the elastic and the and the softening branch. So these will be the ones that we will use for the rest of the project. And depending on the complexity of our microscale, we'll use one of the other or the other. After providing the model with a new Newton operator that can speed up the convergence and give more stability, allowed us to perform simulations after the softening branch. But we still need to solve this constitutive equation and each one of the of the Newton iterations and each one of the Gauss point of our micro microscale. So we remind that this constitutive equation needs the integration of a discrete element model that needs to be computed numerically. It means that this is time consuming. As a result, <coughs> we have the computational time issue of our model. What we propose to parallelize it uh, using the new the nowadays architectures that uh, will allow us to re reduce the total computational time. To understand the kind of parallelization that we use in this code, I have to explain how finite element models work. In a finite element code, we have two sequential parts. One is the element loop, in which we will integrate the constitutive law, it's the equation that I showed in the previous slide. And we will assemb assemble the global status matrix with the contribution of each one of the nodes via the transformation of the shape functions. And when this loop is ended, I put from 1 to n, meaning n the number of uh, elements we have in our macroscale. When this loop is ended, we have the global matrix totally assembled. So we, we go to the solver part of our finite element work, which consists in solving a linear system of equations, which I put a simple expression here, where k is the global stress matrix, d the, the displacement vector, and f the force vector. I will recall what I said before, that solving a linear system of equations uh, with the typical methods to the scale of your composition will be proportional, the time devoted to this operation will be proportional to the cube of the degrees of freedom. While the first box I saw in this slide, the time devoted to the element of integration will be proportional to the degrees of freedom without the cube. So it means 
if we have a consideration of Rogan's point needs to solve the consecutive equation that I showed in the previous slide, that it requires the integration of the discrete element model. We have that this very time consuming, and in our case, most of the computational time is spent on the element group. So this is called element intensive code, where S is the speed up and the number of parallel regions of our code, and B is the part of the code that cannot be parallelized. And because I just explained that our code is time, it's element intensive, it means that if we are parallelizing the element loop, the solver, this equation, B will tend to zero because B is the time devoted to the solver. So in the equation number A, we see that in this case, this kind of parallelism will be very efficient in our code. So this is what we, we use. And the result, uh, of using this parallelization is the performance I show in the plot. So this is the same simulation in which I show two bars and this is the total computational time in hours. We see that by using a eight core machine, we get a speed up of seven. And using a 12 core machine, we, use, we get a speed up of nine. So it's very linear. We keep increasing the number of available cores of a machine. We we'll keep speeding up uh, our simulation. <coughs> Now I will present something that was not uh, one of the objects of the PhD, but it's something that we found during the validation of our um, parallel, parallelized code. To introduce the subject, I will show this um, computative law addition that is just saying that if we use, if we change the order of the terms in an addition, we get the same result. Actually, it is not true in numerical application because each time we perform a floating point operation, we are adding the numerical errors. And changing the order of our addition will change the final result. Why this uh, affects uh, our parallelization? As I said, mm, the finite element code can be divided into parts, the element loop and the solver. And the element loop, I show that it will compute the, the elements from 1 to n in a pre-established order, usually. But what we do in a finalized code is, for instance, if we have 12 cores, we'll take 12 elements, send to the 12 cores separately, and then when each one, when it finishes the computation, will send back the results, and the results will be transformed into the nodes via the check function, and they will be assembled into the global status matrix. Because we cannot control the time that each one of the different computations takes, it can happen that the cores give the results in a different order than the pre-established one. So, because I just said that the commutative law, law of addition doesn't apply in numerical applications, by doing so, we are adding little numerical errors in the assembly of our statement, global stiffness matrix. I simulated this by generating two global stiffness matrix in which I solved the same constitutive laws and I assemb assembled them in different orders. I compared the result of the diagonal of this global stiffness matrix and we see that we have little discrepancies in some of the elements that show that we don't get the same result. We may say, why we care about this? Because we see that the magnitude of this is around 10 to the minus 16. This is of the order of the numerical zero of the machine. So a priori, this will not worry anyone because it's much lower than the precision level that we are using in our micro and in our finite element model. And especially, this will not uh, make anyone worry against engineering applications because it is very far from the precision usually used. But if we compare two simulations that uh, one is running sequential mode and the other one is using this parallelization that eventually will change the order of the sense of the global stiffness matrix, we see that we get <coughs> sen sensibly different results which di with differences much higher than the, than the numerical error. This is because we are in a problem which has no unique solution. So we have bifurcation. And eventually, this little um, discrepancy in the global status matrix is able to trigger different results after the bifurcation happens. And we can end up with different solutions with the same boundary value problem. This is not something that is wrong. It's just that we are triggering different possible solutions. To, so it's something that we should be aware of. Also, I want to mention that exactly the same happens with the, the renumbering of the nodes 
of our maze, which is something usually done in finite element calls to, re that, to reduce the bandwidth of the global standard matrix. So this is not a mechanism with parallelization, which can happen with any remembering or, or anything that changes the pre established order of the assembly. So as the as conclusion, we, the element of parallelization is very effective in our finite element discrete element code. And it allows us to compute with classical finite element codes in terms of computational time. But I, I didn't mention we, what is used in this code is an open MP parallelization. This uses a shared memory paradigm. It means that all the codes that we are using to compute parallel regions of our code need to share the same memory. It means that we are limited by the technology, by the machines, a uh, given number of cores. But if we want to use several hundreds or even thousands of cores, we have to switch to another approach, which is, which is massive parallelization, the message passing interface, which has been implemented in Lagamin by Jardim. Here is our result of our multi-scale code in a compression by Excel test in which we see uh, localization and localization bar. This is the second line of strain. But we see that the same problem, which is made with, uh, using two different refinements, gives us two different results. And this is not good. The model is not objective. Why this happens? To understand this, we have to look at the balance equation of our model. And we see that in the first term, we have a sigma epsilon. It's a classical Cauchy, Cauchy expression. And we, if we look at the epsilon, because of the way, this is a virtual strain field, but we can think of a normal strain. Mm, because the way that strains are computed in engineering, this is a, a, a dimensional parameter. So it doesn't include any length parameter. Because in our considered equation, we, it doesn't appear any length. It happens that the model will have a problem which is called maze dependency. It means that when we solve a boundary value problem, when we have maze localization, the shear, the, the bandwidth will be dependent on the on the length scale introduced by the by the geometry of the matrix scale, not by the positive law itself. So we want to solve this. And what we propose is to provide the model with a second, second gradient regularization. In this equation, we see the same term as before. So the Cauchy first term, Cauchy stress ratio, Cauchy constitutive relation. But we add a second order term, which takes into account the, the second gradient of the deformation. This was developed uh, 18 years, uh, 1989. It's uh, 17 years ago by uh, Rene Shambon and the Nikayari and Takashi Matsushima in this lab. And this has been uh, extensively used in, uh, in numerical models with softening to regularize the solution. What this second order term does is to add an internal length to the model that will avoid this maze dependency. <coughs> This model has an advantage because I have to recall that in the state of the art I show that it already is in the literature a, a non-local regularization of a finite element discrete element model. So this has an advantage with respect to non-local regularizations. This is a local regularization. It means that it can be applied in the same way as classical laws are applied. It can be applied in a material point without needing of the information in the neighborhood of this material point. So in this boundary value problem, I show you that we still have in the right part the microscale providing the, the first order relation. And we have the additional contribution in the left part of the second gradient regularization. The result of this is that we obtain a model which is objective. We see in the, in the three top results that as we refine the maze, this is what I saw at the beginning of this section, we change again and again the solution. And the bottom three results show that 
changing the maze will not change the solution because the model is regularized with this internal length that second value provides. So now the model is uh, objective, it doesn't depend on the maze, so we can refine as much as we want to get a more um, to get more close to the real solution. And this means that now we are able to model real scale problems with any scale with with Tomography. We see that if we extract different RBs from the, our sample, even if it's representative of the same material, we have we will have slight differences in the granular arrangement. So we'll have a bit of heterogeneity coming naturally from from our microscale. This has an important role in the triggering of uh, strain localization. So if we want to have a similar behavior in numerical models, we have to introduce some heterogeneity. Sorry because um, the product doesn't show well the maze, but all the samples here have the same image. Mm. What is done usually to introduce this heterogeneity is to put some weak element or some defect on the geometry that will help to trigger a strain localization emulating the heterogeneity that we find naturally in, in real materials. So in the top line, we see two geometries. One is uh, totally homogeneous, the other one has a weak element, it's the element with the red cross. And then I show the two results corresponding to these two simulations. This is very disappointing because we see that uh, the sample where we input the, the weak element has the same result with the exception that that weak element has a bit of plastification, but the overall uh, response is exactly the same. When we input this weak element to the other side, we see that effectively we change the result by triggering a, a more much localized state. So this is a bit confusing to explain the reason. This is because our discrete element has some, some predisposition to, to, to find a, uh, a given shear band of, uh, orientation. So if we don't put this the geometry of the effect in the place where the shear band was supposed to go because of the microscale predisposition. It seems that the defect, defect is not powerful enough to trigger anything. So the idea that comes from this is that instead of uh, inputting some defect or weak element, what we can do is to use the microscale itself because it has the power to, to change the macroscopic results. So this was the the subject of the of a master project that I supervised and it ended up with a publication in 2016. And in which what we did is to use this property of our microscale. And we can generate different RBs which are representative of the same material. Uh, they have the same granulometric distribution. But because we randomly generate different different grain network, they will have light different homogeneous properties. And if we use these different RBs to build the macroscopic geometry, we can trigger this heterogeneity that we observe in real materials, and we can have uh, more uh, realistic uh, simulation of the strain localization, as well as an improvement of the computational time, because if Newton method is given uh, some help to find the solution, will it take less to find the final solution? So this is a useful feature of our microscale method in which we don't need to input uh, macroscopic defects. We can use the microscale to, to generate this variability. <coughs> Next, with all the features that uh, we described before, we ran a set of parametric tests. This was another master project in RISA 2015. And we, mainly what we did here is to solve the hollow cylinder configurations. We can say that this is a pressure meter test. It's a classical test in which we input pressure in a, in a rock massive to, the, to get its properties. Uh, if we change the loading history by, by a decrease of the inner pressure of the cylinder, we can get a value acceleration, for instance. So in this first test, what we did is to try to find the, the best uh, open radius that didn't affect the, in, the inner solution. 
and we'll be having class in this section because it's just for an active test. Then I show here that the model can both um, use the micro and the macro properties to calibrate and to represent the boundary value problem. So the first one we are using a property of discrete elements, which is that we can use the we can change the potential number, which is the ratio between the contact number and the particle number, without changing the density of our sample. This will help us to emulate the behavior of 3D materials, which is very difficult if not with a two-dimensional discrete element model. And in the right, I show a macroscopic anisotropic stair state that we control via the boundary conditions at the finite element cost. Finally, I show that the, this multi-scale model can also allow us to input the intrinsic anisotropy that comes from the microscale. So what we do after the preparation of our RMB, which has almost uh, isotropic properties, is that we submit this RMB to a uh, loading and loading in a biaxial path. This is what I show you in this plot. So we load it, and the straight line going back is the unloading path, which is almost elastic. But during this loading and loading period, it's undamaged. So the contact network will be slightly rearranged, and uh, some cohesion bonds will be broken. So after doing this procedure, the microscale will have slightly different properties in the different directions. So it became intrinsically anisotropic. Here I show results of multi scale test with the three configurations, in which the first one is uh, isotropic, and the two next are uh, uh, intrinsically anisotropic microscales with more and more anisotropy. So if we combine this this technique with the one I showed in the previous slide in which we can change the, the far field stress state. We can virtually emulate any real situation in which we have an isotropy coming from the geological genesis of our rocks and from the stress state of our atmosphere. <coughs> Finally, I want to show as an example an engineering scale problem in which I show a big configuration. Big means there are a lot of degrees of freedom at the macro scale. There's a 5,000 element configuration, 66,000 uh, degrees of freedom. And this takes around one day with all the features that we implemented to the model. So I didn't tell, but at the beginning, the, when I talk about the computational time, non conversions, uh, running this kind of simulation before the implementations I showed in this presentation took around one or two months. So we could reduce from one or two months to one day, which can already be used in practical applications for engineering purposes. And as an example, I show an RV at the end of this test, which is extracted from the element in the red element here. We show the um, force network, which is in equilibrium with the macroscopic boundary conditions. <coughs> We build a multi scale model that uses a micro scale to provide a constant flow to our, to our continuum. But because uh, it has very bad performance, we can need to provide an alternative Newton operator. We parallelize the code in the element loop. And eventually, we also provide the model with second gradient regularization that avoids the maze dependency that we also observe in, that we always observe in softening materials. And after all these modifications, we can model real scale problems like the one I showed in the previous slide. <coughs> the perspective is to, to calibrate the microscale with experimental data, which can be extracted from tomography, for instance, or microscope experiments. Then work in the 3D ma uh, microscale, which will give a ma much more realistic behavior, which even what I said about the correlation number that emulates this behavior, uh, we need a real 3D microscale. This already a work in progress in this lab by, by Ken Will. And uh, eventually, if we want to use a much more complex ma microscale with much more uh, grains or uh, complex uh, physics behavior, we can uh, use a massive parallelization with the message passing interface, which is already implemented in the I mean, to use a much higher number of cores 
Supervisor, am I right? Yeah. Um, Stefano Dalfon from Université Grenoble Al. The other supervisor, Professor Denis Kairi, and Director of Research, CNFS Jacques Derue. Okay. And <laughs> the last supervisor, uh, Gael Combe, Professor of Université Grenoble Al. And finally, myself, Ricola uh, from Liège University. Um, I will give a call for the different member of the jury. The question will be asked either in English or in French, not in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, but of course, you may answer all the time in English if you want. And the first speaker <coughs> will be the commander. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to, to congratulate you on the thesis and the, your many supervisors because it is uh, a very, a very well, uh, very well written, very interesting. Uh, it is very well structured. References are, are okay. Uh, originality. Even if you were uh, referring to previous work, uh, you, you have contributed with a lot of things. Uh, I think, uh, I repeat, the work it has been extensive and serious. And uh, regarding the presentations, uh, the presentation I, I, I have also liked very much because, first of all, probably you were in Oshawa when it uh, was, um, uh, I think it was Nimitis Colimbas explaining about how presentation should be. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was saying something that uh, less is more or little is whatever, so uh, the presentation was excellent. Many people forget about that the maximum number of lines in a slide it shouldn't be more than 12, which is more or less what, uh, what you have done. In this way, everything is, is very clear, and then people can concentrate on reading, and they, they will be able to read, because after a certain age, it is not always easy. Uh, talking about my children. Then uh, you have also concentrated in the most important part of the thesis. I think that you have uh, for 45 minutes you have to select, so this is um, this is perfect. And another thing which is also quite interesting, quite nice, very honest, it is that in addition to explain what are the advantages of the method that you are proposing, you have explained very clearly both in the manuscript and in the presentation which are the drawbacks, which are the things that you don't like and the things that you, some, somebody else will, will, will have to, to solve in the future. Uh, regarding the, the my, this is my, my general opinion, and of course there are, there are some, some questions. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, as, as we are using this sort of spell checking uh, programs, there are sometimes that the, that the speller uh, change the word, and the creation, for instance, is, is correct, but it is creation. But it is it is not it is not important. I mean, I just spotted one, but it is uh, and it, it is very difficult to, to see because the the speller are like that. Well, um, another thing which I was curious it is that in the thesis in the in the document you don't refer to all the papers you have published because uh, I think that you are only uh, referring to more or less half of the of all the papers. I understand that the 2016, perhaps, uh, you cannot include them, but, uh, but there are more things. And I think that uh, for people interested in your work, this is an important, an important thing. Mm, but, uh, and then, uh, let us start discussing things. Uh, you have chosen para uh, going parallel because you are here in Grenoble and so, and at a certain moment in the thesis you refer to, to uh, GPUs, to graphic uh, processing units or to that. What is your opinion? Would it be uh, they could coexist 
hot methods together, <coughs> or would you advise to use CUDA for some parts? Sorry, GPUs using GPUs for some part of the of the process, or yes, in my opinion, because uh, we use a multi scale model in which the microscale is like a black box, in which we input strength and we get the stress result. We could use a discrete element code which is parallel using CUDA. So yes, this would be very to use a so something that you recommend if there is anybody here following your work? Okay. The, another question is gradient versus non-local. Uh, I remember, I, I must say that I have uh, only worked a long time ago with gradient, but uh, at this time, I think we were talking about 92, uh, either GP or the example, or a divorce, they were saying, there is a paper in which they, they, they show that both approaches are, are more or less the same. The gradient, you are taking, to obtain a gradient, you need information from your surroundings, in which, and from non-local, you do it in a, in a, uh, by integration. So what, what is your opinion? Well, I understand you are here from the noble, and then uh, <laughs> talking about that the gradient is, uh, is not, uh, or there are other options. As far as I know, using a local approach doesn't give us problems in the boundaries because the, we need to know the, the neighborhood of the material point inside the elements. But I think in a non-local approach, you will need to go further. So when you approach the boundary, if your boundary value problem, you will need to define some extra conditions. But in addition, yes, I'm in the so. <laughs> 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 Okay, okay. Uh, Another question regards the extension of uh, the dynamics of, of what, uh, what you are doing. Uh, using discrete elements, sometimes you have to arrive to a stabilization. You are adding some sort of damping. What would it happen to dynamics? Because in many cases, I think that it is, uh, that would be a, a problem to, to solve. Yes, because we are coupling two models. Which is, one is quasi-static, which is a macroscopic approach, and in the microscope you have a dynamic code. So what we do is to make sure that the dynamic property doesn't compare to the microscope. So we have some criteria like a, a kinetic energy, number of contact sliding, etc. So we are very strict with this criteria to, to make sure that our this element is in equilibrium and it, has, it doesn't have dynamic. Okay. Uh, well, I will. Well, there is uh, in page 81, we talk about the time step problem. And the problem should be very small because you just devote 10 lines to the problem. Is that, is that so? Or choosing the time increment, it is, it is not a problem here? Or the time increment at the macro scale? Well, uh, here, if we go, you, you have a, a, I mean, I'm just curious about that. I, I suppose it's both of them. Uh, we are talking about numerical simulations. What is this page? 81, so 81 is here. Yes, it's before numerical simulation. The time discretization, the time set problem, the problem of the evolution of a body assumed to be a, a local second gravity because it can now be formulated with the purpose, the purpose of building, but it's not the, the logging process is discretized into finite time step, set that is, but the, so, as, as you are saying that there is a problem, I was just wondering if there is something more than Nine. Yes, the, because the problem is non-linear, we solve step by step at the macro scale. Mm -hmm. So yes, we can change the size of this uh, macro loading steps, mm -hmm. but this doesn't have a big influence. If we want to increase the precision in following the macroscopic loading path, we can refine these this steps, but at the end, uh, it doesn't give numerical problems. We can increase these uh, loading steps. Okay, also because you are doing something uh, which is uh, implicit somehow. Okay. Uh, now I, I'm going to deal with uh, with something that was I was a little bit amazed. It is the uh, convergence. You 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 was involved in a lot of a lot of effort uh, to Newton methods, and uh, I think you you were uh, what you were showing it, it, it is more than perfect. Which are the the tangent the operators you prefer? However, uh, in the case that you don't get convergence, and then or very long times of convergence. I was wondering if there would be any problem with the uh, condition number of the equation system. 
Yes, we also talk about that. But uh, at the end, what we do is to provide different operators. We don't, we don't use a conditioning method to all of global business matrix. But I think the problem could be related to the condition number, because when we get some operator that gives uh, singular matrices, we are inputting some zeros in the global statement.